Hello, it's December 11th, 2022. This is the seventh day that I am has had me uh, do a video with regard to the Mark of the Beast. Last night was the only night uh, of the seven that he did not wake me up. <clears throat> so I had a actually a 10-hour night's sleep, which was um, amazing because he had uh, been waking me up after two or three hours, night after night. But I was empowered by the Holy Spirit to go on for that time and <clears throat> do 22 videos. Um, this is the epilogue to the Mark of the Beast and it's called the cross. My wife yesterday suggested that the cross was the Mark of God. Now, that's interesting uh, because I barely talked about the cross in this entire uh, video series. Now, of course, the cross was mentioned in various ways because it's upon the cross that Jesus died and shed his blood for us that reconciled us to God. And it's also interesting that... <clears throat> The Tav is represented in picture form as a cross, and the meaning of it is, one of the meanings is Mark. So Jesus said that he was the Aleph Tav, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he is, and he's everything in between. So Jesus, the Christ, is all in all. And that's what he means. I am the first and the last. I am the Aleph Tav. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Almighty. So it's very interesting that the Tav, the last Hebrew letter, is represented by the cross. And it means a mark. And it is a mark that we who believe in Christ also have. <clears throat> now the mark of God is Christ himself who lives in our hearts. It's the word of God within us. Christ is the word. And so the mark of God is the Word of God within us, that's the seed that was sown by Him. And we have a responsibility to keep that seed alive and growing within us. I want to take you first today to um, Colossians chapter 1. Paul begins to pray for the Colossians. In verse 9, he says, We have not ceased praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the Kodeshim, the Holy Ones, in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. His beloved Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So all of the spiritual rulership, whether it's, well, the invisible spiritual rulership, and then all the visible rulership, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, 
the ecclesia, the called out ones. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to, to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He reconciles to himself all things. See, there is a restoration of all things, all men and all invisible things will be reconciled to him. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. So you see, you are saved. You will be saved, ultimately. But you can lose your salvation now if you don't remain stable and steadfast. It's the same word everywhere. Once you understand the word of God, then you see it everywhere and you understand it because now you know it. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the ecclesia. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that somehow we who believe fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. That, so that's why, that's one reason why we go through tribulation and trial and pain and suffering in this flesh. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Okay, Paul, his ministry was to make the word of God fully known. Well, I have a ministry similar because God told me specifically, I want you to teach my word. <clears throat> the word being Christ. I want you to teach Christ. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his Kodeshim, the Holy Ones. To them, God chose to make known how great among the nations are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, that is our mark. Christ in you. Christ in me. The word of God in me. The word of God written on my heart. The hope of glory. That's our only hope. There is no hope for glory otherwise. The only other alternative is the mark of the beast. So we either take the mark of God the word of God, we receive the seed of God, which is his word, which is Christ, and then we do what we can to make this soil that is our flesh hospitable to that word so that that word can produce fruit in us. Him, that is Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So his goal is that you all, that we all will become mature in Christ and that we all will manifest the glory of Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. <clears throat> now concerning the cross, Jesus had something to say about it. You find it in... Uh, Matthew 16 and Luke 9, and we're going to read the account in Luke 9 today. <clears throat> Verse 18. Now it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of the old has arisen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God, the Messiah of God, the anointed one of God. 
And Jesus strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now Jesus knew that he was going to die on a cross. And isn't it interesting that he used this simile, this parable, that you must take up your cross daily and follow me. What is the cross? It's where we die. We die to our own desires. We die to our own pursuits. We die to our own selfish ambition. We die to our own wanting to get rich. We die to the things of this world. We die to Babylon the Great. Take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. You know, people took the vaccine so they could continue to indulge in Babylon the Great with vacations and things like that. It was utter insanity for me to watch people do that just so they could get on an airplane and travel to go somewhere to have fun. Unbelievable. Whoever would save his life, in other words, do the things that he wants to do, you know, to party in Babylon, will lose it. But whoever loses his life, you know, whoever, whoever decides to get out of Babylon and to stop pursuing selfish ambition, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if he can go on vacations and he can do this, 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 and this, and yet he loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So, Jesus says that we are to take up our cross daily. Now, it's interesting. God rested on the seventh day. <clears throat> and this seventh day, last night, I had 10 hours of rest slept all night. I was not planning to do another uh, video in this series, in fact. <clears throat> but it was interesting, today when I looked on my uh, Kindle Fire, that suddenly I saw what I'm going to read to you next. And went, I mean, my eyes went directly to this line that said, the cross by which your self-life is crucified is not your salvation. In other words, it's not your mark. It's not the mark of God. And then the next line says, Christ alone is your salvation. Well, isn't that interesting? <clears throat> I don't remember seeing that. I mean, I, I know that I did pull it up because it's part of a, um, a group of writings that, that Prophet Kenneth Vischer sent me about a week ago, right as I was beginning this uh, video series. But I, I hadn't read it to my recollection. So what I'm going to do now is read this. God provided it to me on the day of rest. I was resting. So I'm going to read now. There's two visions he has, and then he talks about them. The first vision. Then I beheld the face of God, gazing intently upon the nations on the earth, even at this present time, as it were, present tense. As he gazed, I noticed that he was allowing men to live and exist as they wanted to. God was drawing men, but not requiring full obedience from them. But I saw also that there was a small group of people scattered throughout the earth, distanced from one another. Upon them, the face of God was set, and his judgment was manifest towards them. With intensity, he required their complete attention and yielding to his working power. As they did, they were conformed more and more in two ways. First, they were more and more identified with Jesus in his suffering. That is, that would speak of the cross. They were the ones who picked up their cross daily. Second, 
They were more and more identified with Jesus in his resurrection. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Both worked together at the same time by the judgment of God, which was upon them. The judgment of God was upon them. So they're being judged. God disciplines every son whom he approves. These are the few who will form the army of the Lord, the ones he is about to manifest in bodies glorified. To these few is the face of God set in intensity. Second vision. The earth and all the nations in it, even in this very time we are in at this very moment, the nations were all assembled upon the earth and through them and as them was the appearance of a wild beast. Okay? This is Babylon the Great. This is the beast, man the beast, manifested throughout the earth. The beast spoke out blasphemies against God and against his people. The beast was ravenous. It trampled and devoured the flesh of men, consuming them relentlessly without any rising to contest it. And that's what we've seen. We have seen that now for year after year after year. I believe Ken had this vision about 12 years ago. Men fell down to worship this beast, to try to get it to stop consuming them. But the beast regarded not men and devoured them consuming them in its jaws and breaking them to pieces. All the men on the earth, all the inhabitants of this world were consumed and torn by the ravings of this beast. And I saw that this beast seemed out of control. Yet at the same time, I saw that the beast, while consuming men, had grown to full stature and that God began to judge the beast. <clears throat> now he quotes Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 to 21. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and the flesh of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Of course, that's Jesus. And we see him on the horse just a few verses before this in Revelation 19. And the army of heaven, that will be the Kodeshim who are glorified with him. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before the beast with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both, both the beast and the false prophet, so the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's talking about being cast into outer darkness and into the judgment of God. Notice they're cast alive into that. They're going to be judged. They're, they are going to be judged. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, is there a literal sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus that kills people and strikes them dead and sends their blood spewing over the earth? Of course not. What's this talking about? It's talking about the word. The word of God is going to come forth in power from Christ and his Kodeshim who are with him at what is called the second coming of Christ. That sword is a sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. And that word of God is going to kill these people. That means they're going to repent. See, we've misunderstood. We see this as being carnage and blood and guts and you know that's the end of the world that the church has, has pictured but no it's the great revival that the church keeps waiting for only occurs when the kodeshim are glorified and then the word of god comes forth with such power that people are killed that means they repent they 
die to themselves and live for God. That's what this is talking about. I saw then that this was indeed what was being brought about, even in our day, to the mass of mankind that is alive upon the earth, even in this very hour. Okay, those were the two visions Ken had. Now we're going to see what he has to say about these. <clears throat> and this is what I saw when I first got up today. The cross by which your self-life is crucified is not your salvation. It's not your mark. It's not the mark of God. Christ alone is your salvation. He, as the personage of the Lord God Almighty, even the true Christ, he is the salvation wrought for all mankind. Not that mankind would be a blended mixture before him, but each individual in each time frame of world history and from every quarter of the earth, all of them have salvation in the, the, the living Christ. The cross is but the means by which God teaches us to cancel out anything that is of self, anything that is not of the Lord in our lives. We are not saved by the cross. We are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, who in his person is our salvation. Full salvation is completely guaranteed to humanity because of his person and because he is indeed the I am of salvation. Now, <clears throat> notice that Ken speaks the same thing I say. Who says these things? When you begin to understand what the scripture really talks about, you will begin then to know who is a true prophet of God and who is not. Because the true prophet of God speaks the same thing as another true prophet of God. All of the false prophets speak false things. For the overcomer in this hour, the sign of his coming is not because they grow in full knowledge and in great power, and in a height that has never been reached before. The sign of the coming of the Lord in the first resurrection is not by a vast vocabulary being created and by a powerful impetus to be filled with the power and the knowledge of God. In other words, it's not show. It's not you know, smoke and mirrors. It's not mist going across a stage while you prance. The sign of Jesus coming is full salvation. That salvation that can only come from him without our participation in it, as to contributing to its ability to find us saved. The sign of the Son of Man is his salvation, wrought fully in a people who are not more and more complex, but more and more simple, childlike, filled with a singular desire and hope, a people who have borne crosses, but also who know that life is not in the cross, but that life is in Jesus that the cross being found as a faithful tool in their lives prepared them for the day of manifestation. That manifestation can only come when that cross has completed its work, and that work can only be completed when the overcomers have the full distinction in themselves of that which is of flesh versus that which is of spirit. That which God saved versus that which God will not save. In their lives, <clears throat> They will be alone, separate, cut off, found apart from all others, and found to be enduring the impaling process of the cross. For them, salvation to the uttermost is achieved when the cross is doing its greatest work. When the cross is working with all power to cancel out self, then Christ is also at the same time working with all power to raise up your inner man, the newly created life that arose in his person when he rose again from the tomb. That is the true identity of the overcomer. <clears throat> in this very time we are in, waiting for the coming of the Lord, the mind of God is working to give us this simplicity. His work and his thoughts towards us is to remove from us any that complicates life. In his mind, he desires that we be like little children, fully believing his promises and not at all caught up in natural reasoning concerning the method, the means by which he works in us. In the mystery of God, he works to bring us into that same expression of who he is as a person.
the same expression. He is a mystery to natural thought, distanced and not known by man, because God desires to know him in full understanding of the mystery of God in spirit. His work then is to confine us to his will. <clears throat> then he makes a reference to the studies that this writing is part of. I'm going to read that because I'm going to put a link to this, and you can go on and read more of uh, Ken Vischer's words regarding these things. Part of these studies will be the mystery of his will, by which we can see what it means to walk in accord with his will in the Spirit all of the time. The fact that pressure is increasing, increasing in your life and tribulation is not yet over, and that's a fact. This, this year was the hardest year of my life. The pressure was the highest. The tribulation was the greatest. The fact that pressure is increasing in your life and tribulation is not yet over is proof that God is working in you. For the pressure and the tribulation you endure is a benefit to you if you are indeed learning that knowing God is simplistic, not complicated, a joy and not a great burden. The Lord is allowing pressures to increase in the life and emotions of his overcoming saints so that they will learn to get their eyes off the world and onto him alone. As he does this in your life, you will find your walk becoming more simple, more clean cut, more and more with his thoughts interjecting and becoming one with your own thoughts. You will actually learn to be patient and to glory in tribulation because when you are in such a state, you will have all you need to think correctly with the mind of God. His workings are to teach you that you are indeed joined unto his spirit. For they that are joined unto the Lord are one spirit, and the pressures on your life will give you all you need to walk by the same thoughts that are in his very mind. The more simple, the more godlike you become. <clears throat> God is working just now exponentially in the lives of they that will be manifested in the first resurrection. This may sound different to you, for when you look at your life, you do not notice changes that are more to the positive, rather you see long trials, long terms of pressure, and engagements in battle that take place over very long periods of time. When you look in the mirror, you see that faith is a long exercise, a method of keeping sane in the midst of a world that is growing ever more insane. You find hope for the coming of Jesus, seeing the destructions beginning around you, and you wonder just how long it will be until he comes to complete his promise. Instead of great spiritual prosperity, like the false prophets and the false teachers are delivering to the masses right now, you find yourself sitting alone outside these places of mirth and gladness, and your life is quite often surrounded in misery and solitude. There are times when the presence of the Lord is real, but more often there are times when heaven is like brass. The sky is dark, gloomy. The Lord is not seen tangibly in your faith. God truly has become a mystery for you are left bewildered as to what exactly he's doing. Dear reader, if that describes you, then know you are exactly in the place that God has worked to bring you. But yeah, that describes me and my wife to a T. That place of aloneness and solitude and quietness outside the fringes of religious mayhem it is in your life because of the working of his spirit in you. And that place of confinement you find yourself in has become for you the very exact center of the will of God in the very mystery of God, and you might not even realize it. The mind of God is this way. He is determined to finish this age with a triumphant resurrection, and he is determined to do this in a company of people who have been emptied of anything that is in this world that lays in a state of comfort and contentment while others believe they will escape the increase in pressure that is coming to the earth. The overcomer in this lowly position is still cast out, still rejected, still a non-entity, not a part of the endless course of gatherings and meetings wherein people try to find the true location of God. <clears throat> you know, try to find God. Everybody goes to conferences and things trying to find the true location of God. But they're the corpse. They're the, they're the vultures gather where the corpse is, where the dead is. That's what Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> the overcomer may be gathering together with a few of like precious faith, but only because those whom they gather with are the same way. They too cannot be a part of what is happening in the world. 
So what has God done to reveal himself to those who are set in this lonely place? He has given to them the first part of his full expression. He has emptied them of all that they are as a people, just as Jesus emptied himself for obedience to his cross. So these have indeed followed this very same pattern. God is revealed in them now in the midst of their solitude of suffering silence. These few, in the agony of their identity with the sufferings of Jesus, find themselves cut off and alone. But through these few will be the release of all creation out of the bondage of the curse of Adam's fall. God will utter his voice before this company. This is uh, referring to Joel, the, the great army. When Ken talks about the great army, he has in mind the um, the army you see in, in the book of Joel. <clears throat> God will utter his voice before this company. That utterance is the same utterance that wrought salvation through Jesus when he hung alone upon the cross. Through him, God wrought the reconciliation of all things. Now through the emptied out overcomer, he will literally poise creation to have the curse of death lifted off of it. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass, trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. In the very mystery of God, this will be, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make all people a feast of fat things. Notice he's quoting a scripture dealing with this mountain. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. They will feast on the mountain, on the mountains of the Lord. A feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. In other words, he will destroy deception on this mountain, on the mountain of the overcomers. And the veil that is spread over all nations, he will destroy on this mountain. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for I am has spoken it. And it shall be said that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is I am. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. That, by the way, is one of the scriptures that God used to show me who the mountains are and what the mountains are. God has determined in his mind that creation will be completely delivered from death. And he has determined in his mind that this will be done through the little company of overcomers, his glorious army, following Jesus upon white horses, you, dear reader, are part of that company. You will take part in the first resurrection. Ken's ministry is to the overcomer. That's why he says this, because only the overcomers can bear to read this stuff. You know, other people just throw it out. They, they reject it out of hand. So if you're reading it and it's, it's um, corresponding with your spirit, you know, you're affirming it in your spirit, then be, be uh, confident, be assured that you will be part of this resurrection company. Man has waited for 2,000 years for Jesus to come again. He is going to come. Don't lose hope. For God to restore this creation, he must first bring to pass a portion of his will. In his thoughts, he has determined that the mystery of iniquity has come to the full. And now he will work to end that mystery so that his purpose will be completed. See, the man of lawlessness has been revealed. So be confident. We are at the time when Christ can return because all the signs have occurred. The end of that mystery and the introduction of Christ ruling over this world, even unto the, even unto the ends of the earth, will only take but a brief hour of time. At the same time, the overcomers will be introduced to this creation as saviors. Remember that scripture. Saviors come upon Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, upon whom the judgment of the world will rest and death will be removed. Prior to this happening, though God is going to shake everything in the world. So prior to this happening, though, God is going to shake everything in the world. So the whole world is being shaken now. 
He's going to shake everything to pieces, and nothing will survive the shaking. That's why he put it in the heart of the beast to destroy Babylon the Great. That destruction of Babylon the Great is the great shaking. First, he will shake the world's economic system. Along with that, he will shake the political and kingdom systems and will expose the leadership in their hearts for everyone to see. He will shake them in such a way that the economists and politicians will turn to the religious world for help. But the religious world is also going to be shaken and they will utterly fail to help anything of the political or economic portions of the world. All three together will be shaken right to the core, right to the place where iniquity is rooted. The great city was split into three parts. Remember that? I think that's uh, Revelation 16. So it appears to me that Ken is saying that's the political, the economic, and the religious. This has started and it will not stop until the manifestation of the sons of God. Right in the middle of this shaking, <coughs> as if it were a massive earthquake, God is going to manifest his sons and daughters, the overcomers in glorified bodies. See, we will be manifested just in time. The reason God is doing this is because his thoughts are that he must now restore all things. For him to do that, he must first take away what man has built, must destroy Babylon the Great, what man has built and what man has done so that he can make it new. See, we will... Behold, all things are new, Jesus says in the book of Revelation. And that's what the overcomers are going to do. We are going to recreate the earth. We will have creative ability. We will be like him. Okay, I'm going to start reading again just a little bit above where I stopped because I want to emphasize this. All three together will be shaken right to the core, right to the place where iniquity is rooted. That's the political, the economic, the religious. All three will be shaken because Babylon the Great is falling and all three are, that's Babylon the Great. And they are going to fall. This has started, and it will not stop until the manifestation of the sons of God. Right in the middle of this, shaking as if it were a massive earthquake, God is going to manifest his sons and daughters, the overcomers and glorified bodies. The reason God is doing this is because his thoughts are that he must now restore all things. For him to do that, he must first take away what man has built and done so that he can make it new. For he will create this new and all that is in the world after the shaking will be new, deathless, and will abide in complete peace and harmony. There will be nothing of man or the mystery of iniquity to remove peace from the earth, then. Man must first endure the shaking, for that is the mind of God, to do it. There will be no more fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil approached by man without God. Even the leaves of that tree will be stripped bare. If you are alone, separate, a little bewildered perhaps, know it is because you have been reserved for this time that is now. It is not your flesh that will be used, it is your inner man. That is what the Lord has thought now to do in the earth and it will indeed be wonderful. This inner nature will rise and overtake what is your outer man. The results will be tremendous and it will be done in a new anointing which is even now beginning to manifest. I will put a link to this, and then you can go from there to read other writings in this series. And now, to close this epilogue and this video series, The Mark of the Beast, let's go to 1 John chapter 2. just read a small portion here, about five verses. At the very end of uh, 1 John 2, and the, first, uh, the last two verses of chapter 2 and the first three verses of chapter 3. And now, little children, abide in him, 
so that when he appears, he's talking about Jesus, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him, has been born of him, has received the word within him, has allowed that word to write upon his heart so that he indeed will do, do righteousness from his heart. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God? And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Right now, I am God's child. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Ken Vischer was talking about what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, like God. We shall be like God because we shall see him as he is. God is recreating himself. That's the mystery of creation. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure.